So we're going to move to the final part of our program, which is the keynote by Charlotte Webb on what is a feminist AI, uh, possible feminisms and possible internets. But before we go into that, we have a little announcement that we want to share with you, which is about our next conference of September, which is called Citizens of Evidence. And we have Rachel here from the School of Machines who wants to tell you already something about this. Hi. Oh, again, so loud for me, sorry. Well, obviously I work in education, guy in the front. <laughs> I mean, because you know my question. Okay, anyway. So basically I just wanted to make this announcement. I work, I mean, I run School of Machines Making and Make Believe, which is an independent school here in Berlin. I say hovering at the intersection of art, technology, design, and human connection. And basically the idea is to try to learn, like the goal is to learn technology while questioning it at the same time. And anyway, so we're partnering with the Disruption Network Lab for a workshop in um, September called Evidence. And it's a week-long intensive workshop and we'll kind of be focused on looking at the ways that creative technology are being used for um, kind of uh, like shedding light on things that, you know, like kind of with like human rights and this, and this kind of thing. So I'm gonna post the links on the Facebook group page. Uh, but if anybody's interested in particular, obviously women and people of color are, and, and LGBTQ and like just n people that we don't normally see in the tech world are really encouraged to apply. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rachel. So I will briefly introduce our keynote speaker, Charlotte Webb. Uh, she's the co-founder and the chief leopard of the initiative Feminist Internet. And this is a non-profit that is advancing internet equalities for women and for other marginalized groups through creative and critical practice. And uh, she's also the founding, founding director of Evan, which is an ethical technological agent consultancy. Um, and she was nominated by the Evening Standard as one of the most influential people in technology and science in London in 2018. And she's been featured, amongst others, by the BBC, Evening Standard, Marie Claire, and also presented recently at TEDx, uh, Internet Age Media, and the Barbados Internet Governance Forum. Uh, she has over 10 years of experience in art and design and higher education, and she's focused on equipping students with the attribute that's needed to thrive in the creative digital industry. So we're very excited to have her here today to talk more about the feminist AI. So welcome, Charlotte. Thank you, Lika. That introduction actually made me feel even hotter than I already am, kind of flushing. Um, thank you so much to the team for organizing this amazing conference um, and to the panelists that we've already heard from this evening. I've learned a lot already. I kind of wish I'd have heard the presentations before writing this presentation because I probably would have said a few different things. But I think it's really amazing that there's so many connections between what everyone's talking about so far. So thanks for that. A quick thank you also to... Um, Connor, who's not here, but he's the visual designer of Feminist Internet, and the reason why slides look sexy um, from a Feminist Internet perspective is that he's amazing, and um, he always makes the decks look great. So thank you, Connor, even though you can't hear me. A quick warning before I start. This presentation does contain standards, um, and it also does contain... Um, airplane turbulence, which is probably the only way I'm going to now refer to theory as. So thank you, Maya, for that. I think that's a brilliant way to think about it. So, as Lika said, Feminist Internet is a non-profit organization, and our mission is to make the internet a more equal space for women and other marginalized groups through creative and critical practice. Uh, our motto is that there is no feminism, only possible feminisms, and there is no internet, only possible internets. And really this indicates that we believe there's kind of infinite expressions of feminism, and it kind of acknowledges the fact that what the feminist cause looks like, um, what it means, really depends on who you are and where you are and what other struggles you're facing. It recognizes the central concept of intersectionality, foregrounds our awareness that gender oppression is only one of many interlocking systems of oppression and that when it uh, meets capitalism or white supremacy or colonialism, it is expressed in distinct ways and those ways impact on people's lived experiences distinctly as well. The, the internet part is 
kind of touching on the, our belief that the internet, whilst obviously riddled with problems, um, it doesn't have a fixed future. So it does still hold this great transformative potential. Um, so I'm quite positive about that and really want to hang on to that. So the reason that we exist is that despite the internet's extraordinary potential, as I've just kind of mentioned, for human connection, cultural production, positive social change, even economic growth, we know that there's lots of problems to address and some of the ones that we're kind of focused on, obviously the problems are not limited to these, um, are online abuse. This does affect everybody but disproportionately affects women and girls and members of other marginalized groups. The predominance of men and a culture of misogyny in the technology sector, as I'm sure you're aware. AI bias, which we're obviously here to talk about this evening. And corporate monopoly and the impacts that that has on our, again, our lived experiences and our, the production of our subjectivities. So we all know that these problems are real at Feminist Internet. We really, really want to do something about them. Um, and specifically, we want to use an approach that combines art design, critical thinking, uh, creative technology development, and feminism. So that's our special spice mix. Um, we're all here tonight because, you know, we, we know that we're sort of surrounded by biases in ourselves and in AI systems, and presumably we want to do something about it as well. So I'm going to share some thoughts this evening about how I think feminist methods can inform the development of less biased technologies um, and try to ponder the question of what a feminist AI might be. So I'm going to talk to you about a body of work that we've been focusing on over the last six months or so called Designing a Feminist Alexa. Um, it really took off when we were awarded a fellowship at the new Creative Computing Institute at the University of the Arts London, in London. Um, the work is broadly contextualized by increasing awareness, as we've touched on throughout the evening, across sectors about AI bias. So, um, don't know if you came across the recent UNESCO report, um, which was called I'd Blush If I Could. Um, that report aims to expose gender biases in technology products and also sort of address the global digital skills gap. Um, the title stems from the response that Siri gives if told you're a bitch. Um, that report was featured in all of the major newspapers in the UK. It was literally in every single one. So, you know, we know that this issue's kind of gone mainstream. And um, there's another report that came out recently from the AI Initiative, um, which lays out the, the diversity crisis in the AI sector as they see it. So I'll give you a moment to just take these stats in. Obviously, I really, really appreciate the perspectives we've heard this evening about um, the limits of sort of diversifying teams. And that's something I think I'm going to really take away from this and process a lot more but you know as we have said these 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 statistics are alarming and something does need to be done um, the projects designing a feminist Alexa projects also more specifically contextualized by increasing critiques around how devices like Alexa and Siri and Cortana um, have typically been characterized as female which is problematic because of the way that it reproduces gender stereotypes so, as Jacqueline Feldman says, by encouraging consumers to understand the objects that serve us as women, technologists abet the prejudice by which women are considered as objects. So the idea is that if people learn it's okay to think of women as subservient through their interactions with these devices, then they're likely to continue to develop or kind of reinforce existing unconscious biases. The commonly used capabilities of these types of devices are things like, does that GIF work? Yes. Shopping lists, kitchen timers, to-do lists, um, tasks that have 
historically and typically been associated with female qualities. And what happens is that consumers sort of pr prefer female voices because of the way culture perceives the tasks that the devices were originally designed to perform. Um, obviously, the tech giants want these types of devices to be really, really successful, so they tend to just sort of meet market demand rather than taking the responsibility for unpacking what's behind those types of demands. Uh, which is, and it, the whole thing's kind of ludicrous, really, because it's not actually very long ago since women's voices weren't even permitted on the news because they were considered irritating or un or authoritative or something like that. So we think it's really irresponsible, and we we want to think carefully about what well what is behind these types of demands, and how can we create alternatives that kind of educate and try to shift these systemic problems rather than just complying with demand. There is also the thorny issue of abuse when it comes to these types of devices. For example, this. Oh, did, did this? Did, did you hear that? No. Is the sound on? Oh, we need to plug in the... Um... Somebody says, hey, Alexa, I think you're a bitch, to their Alexa. And Alexa says, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question you asked which is an example of how they've not, they weren't originally programmed to respond very well when they receive this type of language, which happens all the time. Alexa, I think you're a bitch. I can't find the answer to the question I heard. So Apple and Amazon have both created better responses to um, abuse than were originally programmed in. Amazon has a disengage mode, but it's just really a sticking plaster over a much more systemic problem. And um, there's a great article by Rachel Withers who talks about how the best test of whether, well, it's not the best test, but a test of whether someone's good dating material is how obnoxious they are to their Alexa. So we, As I say, we had a fellowship at the CCI in London, and um, I'm going to share a video about that, that fellowship where we ran workshops um, for students tackling this issue. So I'll just play your clip. It's three minutes. Our mission was to design personal intelligent assistants that meet a meaningful need and promote equality for women and other marginalised groups. But wait, we have some serious questions. What the f*** is a feminist conversation? Can there ever be a feminist response to Hey Alexa, what's the weather like today? How would we know whether we created a feminist technology? Luckily, there are some amazing people out there working on ethical tech and we discovered the feminist AI researcher Josie Young who has created a feminist chatbot design process to help people that want to build feminist bots. We adapted Josie's framework for our workshops, focusing on five areas where we could introduce feminist values to the design process. Could we identify users that can be empowered through a feminist PIA? Would our PIAs meet a meaningful human need connected to the user? How are we going to depict or represent our PIAs to demonstrate feminist values? How could we get the PIAs to speak with a feminist voice? How might our own biases be embedded in our designs? You can think of it as almost like a briefing to a programmer who's going to bring the idea to life. So what it picks up is, hi, Alexa, thoughts on feminism. She feels lonely and she needs to talk to somebody, but she's afraid of authority. So we thought maybe the, the tone should be a bit like funny and like lighthearted. Deep and prototype and AI voice interfaces. I want some chicken. Uh, yeah. You want a jerk? All sexual preferences are healthy and acceptable. Are you worried about how you are feeling? So, with 40 students, six days, a common passion, a mission, and a set of standards, we designed eight feminist prototypes. Boo is a safe place to ask embarrassing questions about sexual, emotional and relationship norms. I'm an artificial intelligent bot designed to help you maintain mental well-being throughout your life. 
we put careful consideration into the app's appearance because we did not want Bud to appear to be posing as a real human or display any signs of gender stereotype. Page is a research aid bot which helps the user improve their research skills by encouraging them to think critically and understand source bias. Essie is a PIA that provides an empathetic and informative form of sex education. Penny is a virtual voice assistant that tackles loneliness amongst elderly people. Igami, feel your best self, encouraging self-love at moments of insecurity. Hi Future is a PIA that supports the user in the transition from student to professional life. Alexa, can women be drag queen? Queen are a British rock band that formed in London in 1970. <laughs> So they were two three-day workshops where students that had never met each other from all across the university, from lots of different disciplines, came together. Um, their brief was to create a personal intelligent assistant, well, to imagine and sort of roughly prototype a personal intelligent assistant that would meet a meaningful human need and embody our feminist standards. So it was a, it was a very rewarding process. And I wanted to talk a bit more about the background to the standards that you saw in that clip because they've kind of become our North Star a bit um, and I think they are applicable in lots of different contexts so I'm hoping I've even made I've, I've used them in bra making workshops so I figure that if you can use them there you can probably use them anywhere um, so I'm hoping that they'll be useful for some of you as well um, as you saw in the video, they are adapted from Josie Young's feminist chatbot process, which she wrote in 2017 to help designers, particularly at the sort of conceptual development stage, to avoid consciously or unconsciously perpetuating bias. And Josie's standards were based on a paper from Shawan Bardzell um, from 2010 called Feminist HCI, Taking Stock and Outlining an Agenda for Design. And she also did draw on the IEE's Ethically Aligned Design Standards, which um, we heard about earlier <laughs> from Maya. So um, this is the turbulence in the aircraft bit coming up. So Bardzell says that Feminist HCI, Feminist Human Computer Interaction, is the design and evaluation of in interactive systems that are imbued with sensitivity to the central commitments of feminism, agency, fulfillment, identity in the self, equity, empowerment, diversity, and social justice. And for her, contemporary feminism, which she describes as sort of anti-essentialist feminism that doesn't treat femaleness or femininity as a given fact, that that's a kind of a natural ally to design because it sort of seeks to make visible the ways that gender is constructed in everyday life and then generate opportunities for intervention. Um, so it kind of responds to um, Nicole's question about how feminism um, problematizes objectivity. Um, FHCI also tries to improve understandings about how gender identities and relations shape the design and use of interactive technologies, and also to sort of critique the implicit um, research, research paradigms that exist um, in the field and propo propose alternatives to that. So, uh, again, for Bardzell, um, feminist HCI contains a constellation of qualities. Pluralism, participation, advocacy, ecology, embodiment, and self-disclosure. Pluralism refers to design artifacts that resist any sort of single or totalizing or universal point of view. So it uses the feminist strategy of denaturalizing norms, um, showing what's socially constructed rather than natural, and, and it also deploys the related strategy of finding alternatives to normative discourses um, amongst the marginal. 
participation, following on from the comment that we had um, from the audience at the end of the last presentation, um, participation refers to valuing participatory processes that, this is a quote, valuing participatory processes that lead to the creation and evaluation of design prototypes. So um, there's one phrase in the paper that I think is my favorite uh, that this quality relies on, and it's the idea that knowers are not substitutable for one another. I think that's a really, really amazing design principle that encapsulates some of the things that we've been talking about already this evening. And it's something that I kind of keep in the back of my mind. The quality of advocacy engages with an ethical dilemma. So on the one hand, to make things usable, um, designers and companies often work within the status quo. So that can um, perpetuate these kind of regressive or harmful structures. And a really good example of that, I think, is the voice assistants defaulting to female voices because that's what market preference demands. On the other hand, taking an activist stance can risk privileging the social values of the designer, um, which, again, I think touched on a point, your point, Nicole, about um, the question of who gets to determine um, the common good. Ecology recognizes that all artifacts exist in and relate to each other within this, these very um, large and complex systems. It kind of encourages designers to consider the, the broadest context of the things that they're making um, uh, and to consider the, the implications of what they're making for the widest range of stakeholders. It also um, encourages reflection on how artifacts sort of reflexively construct users as users kind of reflexively construct artifacts, which I think is really, really important um, as we're all more and more aware of how technology is kind of shaping our behaviors. Um, Maya mentioned ethical apparatus, and I think that's another way of articulating this idea of ecology in the ways that the, um, the whole systemic picture is very important to keep in mind. Embodiment. Um, this is about sort of foregrounding bodies, understanding motivations and experiences, not treating potential users as sort of disembodied units that can somehow be um, modeled in an abstract way. And again, Maya, <laughs> Maya mentioned um, this point that uh, she said, not all hearts are the same, which I thought, again, is a lot, like another way of articulating this kind of idea. Self-disclosure, this goes back to Adam's talk, I think, um, where he talked about the, the, this authoritarian logic that you only exist if the system says you exist. So in Bardzell's paper, self-disclosure is actually about software making visible the ways that it constructs its users. So the self here actually refers to the software. Um, so it's about what the, what, um, it's about making people aware of what the software is trying to make of them and, and also looks at the ways that categories, as we've also talked about tonight, fail. Um, uh, yeah. And so, although this paper is, well, it's nearly a decade old, I think it anticipated really well how, how useful the application of feminist critiques can be to ubiquitous computing, which seems so urgent at the moment, um, given this momentous rise of voice technologies and the ways that they're colonizing homes and smart devices all around the world, as we're probably quite aware. But what I really love about feminist HCI is that it, it's quite focused on action. So um, it, it sort of recognized the power of feminist critique but it also helps to kind of push um, that critical agenda into something practical. And that's what I love and we love because, as you said earlier, we really love making stuff and helping other people to make stuff as well. So that was kind of a little chunk of framing. I'm going to show you a video now of one of the prototypes that was made in the workshops that you, we, you saw earlier. Uh, and then I'll go on to talk about how we have adapted our own standards from what Bardzell did. So. Yeah. 
Our PI is called Boo, and nothing is taboo for Boo. Boo is a safe place to ask embarrassing questions about sexual, emotional, and relationship norms. Boo answers questions that you might be embarrassed to ask your parents, friends, or relatives. We believe that sexual education should be available for every teen, regardless of gender. It is important to know about our bodies and the changes that are happening are going to happen. We believe this aligns with the feminist internet directive that FI educates. Boo is designed for teenagers of all identities experiencing puberty. When a lot of changes happen, both physically and emotionally, Boo is here to answer taboo questions and comfort the user by ensuring them that there is no such thing as a weird question. Boo is their sounding board. It listens, it sometimes gives advice, and it makes them feel that everything's okay. Boo is an advocate of inclusive sex education. We believe sex education should not be gendered and introduced at an early age. Our storyboard starts with Silver, a 12-year-old gender-fluid teen who is starting summer camp in the seaside within a few days. Silver has noticed they have started growing hair under their armpits. They ask themselves if this is normal. Everyone else doesn't seem to have hair. People on TV and in magazines have no hair. Why do I have hair? They question. They're confused, so Silver asks a friend if they can relate, but their friend cannot relate to this situation. Silver remembers seeing an app on Snapchat about Boo and decided to give it a try and find out if having hair is normal. Silver takes a while to warm up, but Boo is understanding. Boo explains the facts and reassures Silver they are not a hairy monster. Boo tells Silver that growing hair in new places is part of puberty. After this, Silver feels comforted and calm. Silver feels lit. They can now continue life without worrying about their new body. The information that Boo feeds back is solely factual. It does not give judgments or opinions. Boo fetches data from varied, reliable sources aiming to be objective. If the user asks to empathize with them, Boo will remind the user it's just a bot. Boo's purpose is to feed back information that is most suited for the questions being asked. Boo is a genderless PIA. Its voice and language aims to have a neutral, casual, and friendly tone. Here's an example. I promise you that once you start doing it and really normalize it and internalize it, then it helps so much. This is what a conversation with Boo would sound like. Hi. I'm Boo. Do you need my assistance? So, um, I have a weird question for you. Nothing is too weird for me as I'm a bot. What's on your mind? I'm so fucking confused about how I feel. Please use kinder words. That's no way to start a conversation, Boo. So, sorry, I just feel out of place. Let's start over again. Nothing is too weird for me as I'm a bot. What's on your mind? Um, lately I've had hair growing in new places. Can you tell me more? Yeah, sure. Um, kinda on my legs and on my ar armpits, maybe? That's cool. How does it make you feel? Yeah, I don't know. My friend told me she doesn't get hair there and that it's genetic. What do you mean? I don't know. Is growing hair under your arms normal? Yes, it's normal. Underarm hair starts to appear at the beginning of puberty with growth often completed by the end of the teenage years. My friend says she doesn't have hair under her armpits. No matter where you live, whether you are a boy or a girl, whether you like vanilla or double fudge chunk ice cream, you will experience the changes of puberty. During puberty, your body will grow faster than any other time in your life. Thank you. I feel lit and no longer like a furry monster. You do. Boo. <laughs> Could you hear that? Could you hear the device respond? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so um, I'm going to now just walk you through the five standards that we've been using sort of in all of our workshops um, based on Shawan's work and on Josie's work, which came out of that. So each standard has a top-level question and then sub-questions, and they're basically there to prompt designers, as I say, to um, during the process um, 
and it kind of acts as a very good way we found with students to help them account for sort of feminist decision making because otherwise how would you ever how would you ever be able to substantiate a claim that you have made something feminist um, they all refer to PIA which stands for personal intelligent assistant but as I say they can be applied in lots of other contexts so first off there's a section about considering the user of the technology um, and it pushes back against this idea about universal usability um, which can fail to recognize uh, differences in users experiences and outlooks and it relates back to the idea of pluralism which reminds us that the, the category of human is um, to quote her again too rich too diverse and too complex a category to bear a universal solution and one of the highlights of that workshop for me was a group that initially set out to try and imagine a PIA for people with autistic spectrum disorder. And um, it was really, really well intentioned, but when they started thinking about the user and trying to sort of develop a persona, they realized that without direct experience um, or access to people with that particular condition, it, it might be better for them to focus on something else. Um, and to me, that was a very interesting kind of moment of realization that directly came from engaging with these types of um, prompts. The purpose bit um, considers basically what's the point of making this thing? Is there, does it meet any kind of uh, meaningful human need in the world? And one of the key findings around purpose was that in the end, although we call this whole thing designing a feminist Alexa, no one actually wanted to make a sort of a, a feminist version of, of an Alexa as, it's, as they're currently conceived because that, that, the, sort, the fundamental purpose of retrieving information or shopping or getting rooted to Amazon's marketplace isn't that meaningful in, com in comparison to other things that they could be doing. So um, the kinds of devices being in, imagined just had very, very different um, reasons for existing in the end. Team bias. Um, we heard um, how obviously bias is not a technological problem, it's a human problem. Um, so this is really a, a self-reflective part of the process that um, tries to sort of intervene in the way that we're hardwired for bias. And um, we're like literally riddled with it. I found a Guardian article the other day by um, Galen Strawson who listed the following types of bias, the halo effect, the Florida effect, framing effects, anchoring effects, confirmation bias, outcome bias, hindsight bias, availability bias, and the focusing illusion. So, you know, it's, it's kind of very difficult to avoid doing that. And so we need to sort of constantly check in with our higher reasoning and our critical faculties to intervene in our own sort of neurobiological systems. Design and representation, this bit of the standards is about um, how this device is going to be depicted to the user, how is it going to be represented, and um, how, how that representation or characterization can challenge or reproduce gender stereotypes. Um, it taps into all of the ethical questions that were raised at the Google Duplex demo, I think, um, because it also... In, in, as part of that consideration as how the thing's going to be represented, there's a consideration of how human should it be made to seem. And so you, you probably all saw the duplex demo, but if you didn't, it's a feature of the Google Assistant that um, makes calls on behalf of the owner of the device. So um, it had this very creepily realistic voice that came complete with the sort of ums and ahs um, typical in um, conversation, and it booked hair and restaurant appointments without the person on the other end of the phone knowing that it was a, a robot. So um, obviously that raised a lot of um, ethical questions about um, how far we should be going in sort of making things so um, lifelike that they can be used to um, deceive the user. There is speculation that they faked that demo, but actually if they did, that really wouldn't be great either. So, um, and the final section is conversation design. So, this kind of touches on the whole heart of the thing, like the, all these big questions about what 
is a feminist conversation? How can you make a device speak with a feminist voice? What does that even look like? What does it sound like? And for me, all of those questions about voice, literal and metaphorical voice, are really, really fascinating. I think there's a lot more scope to explore it more. Um, questions of who gets to speak um, and who gets heard are obviously very important as well. Um, one of the factors of bias in uh, voice technology is that some accents are not recognized as well as others. So there's lots of issues here. We were very limited in terms of time as to the kinds of devices the voices could actually have. Um, but there were some experiments. So um, you heard the, the, the Boo team trying to um, think about what a, a, a genderless voice would sound like. Um, they actually used the term androgynous instead, I think, at one stage. And there was another team that um, were imagining a, a PIA for an elderly person that would help combat loneliness, and they gave it the default voice of this radio DJ called Annie Nightingale, who's in her 70s, and they felt like that would be a very sort of relatable um, voice for the user, but they, they, they made sure that they um, allowed them to reconfigure that if they wanted to as well. So yeah, so those are the standards and those are what we've been kind of anchoring our thoughts around lately. Um, basically, when we design a workshop, we sort of map them to each stage of what anyone's doing so that there's always this kind of um, uh, reflective process and a way of evidencing that you've made a feminist decision or you haven't. So um, you can read a whole report about the workshop at the, um, that report link and there's also a longer version of the video. Um, so you can check that out if you would like to know more. Um, I think there are some gaps in the standards at the moment, and they're something that I think we're really looking forward to developing more. There's the issue of data. We've not had any time to, uh, or not, not time, but no scope to train a system on, on a data set. But when we get to that stage, we'd really like to work with um, people that are focusing more on feminist data, like Caroline Sinders, who was mentioned earlier. Um, and I think there's also some issues around labor and the way that labor is configured in um, the production of technologies that should probably be in there as well. So what we're really, really hoping is that we can work more with Josie and with people like Caroline to sort of collectively um, flesh these out and contribute them to uh, to anyone that feels like they could be helpful in their practice. Um, a couple of projects where we've used the standards in our own uh, work. Um, this is uh, actually something we're really proud of and really excited to share because it's the first technology we've actually created. It's called FXA. It's a feminist chatbot which teaches people about AI bias. Um, it's not feminist in the sense that it self-identifies with feminist politics, obviously, because it's not a being, but it's feminist in the sense that it was designed with these standards in mind. Um, so uh, it never says I, and the reason it never says I is because we were thinking so much about that question in the design and representation part of the standards about how human should we make things seem, or how how conscious should we really be about the kinds of um, emotional attachments that people can develop to technologies when they're, when they're interacting with them. It's really hard to make a whole uh, sort of tree system of conversation design without ever using that one small word. But actually, the challenge, I think, can be really, really productive, and it goes to show how, how much constraints can sometimes um, provoke a really interesting new solutions. Um, FX that was created by a team with different races and genders and gender identities and ways of thinking, which bucks the current trend in the AI industry. And small gestures, like it gives um, definitions of AI and feminism from different people, again, kind of going back to our motto about there's no feminism, only possible feminisms, and trying not to have a kind of singular point of view on, on what things mean. Um, it uses a range of skin tone emojis. It sounds like such an obvious thing, but it's just being conscious of how every small decision matters in what you're making. So you can chat with FX uh, on your mobile phone uh, 
at this link. It, it has three pathways. One's about voice technology, one's about recruitment algorithms and the bias in those, and then the other one is about search engine bias, and it's really fun. And then the final project I just wanted to share was um, another workshop that we did with the f a former Amazon Alexa manager, and she's called Catherine Breslin, and she's a really amazing woman. The challenge here was to combine teaching students with no coding experience Python in an hour, getting them to build an Alexa skill in a day, and introducing them to our standards and getting them to use those standards to design an Alexa. Does everyone know what an Alexa skill is? No, okay. Um, so in, you, you have apps for your phone, so you can download apps that, that like, you know, add to the functionality of your phone, and you get them from the app store, and there's also a skill store. So skills are things that people can write to sort of add to the existing functionality of an Alexa. So um, they range from anything to, there's one called Meow Meow, which just allows you to meow at your Alexa, and it will give you a meow back people with time on the hands, but it's actually really cool. Um, uh, games, skills, quiz skills, it's, it's, it's a really interesting kind of, this is an interesting ecology because Amazon basically created this platform called Blueprint where people can make their own skills and they open source that. You don't have to, you don't have to interact with Amazon to build a skill. So yeah, it's a very interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting economy. Um, this is a very brief video uh, to give you a sense of what happened on that day. I think we have to be prepared for the growing creative technology industries. I think every time you learn a new coding language, they gain a big, better understanding of computational thinking. And even if you're not going to go into software development, it's nice to be aware of these processes so you can go into the industries and work with the people in the future. It was really interesting to see how we could bring different skill sets together to create something. It's nice to see what people are up to, how they use this workshop to fit into their personal practice or interest because people are coming from everything from fashion psychology and illustration to probably maybe more content specific like user interface design. This has given us not just coding experience but also just to think about what makes a conversation feminist. if students at UAL are interested in going into the field of tech. It's weird. <laughs> Own face whilst also talking is really strange. Oh. Um, all right, so that was a flavor of that workshop. We, we were kind of grappling with this problem, uh, or this question of um, whether using a corporate monopolies platform to um, to teach students is sort of antithetical to feminist politics. Um, as we heard earlier, we can't, we can't trust platforms like that to, to sort of do the right thing. And I think one can also level quite a heavy critique um, of the way that Amazon's relying on the free labor of users to, <laughs> to get ideas and build stuff. Um, we had a really, really open discussion about that with the participants of the workshop. Um, I think it's something that we're still reflecting on, but I do think there's an argument for kind of subverting systems that exist around us and trying to problematize these corporate monopolies tech in sort of meaningful and transformative and constructive ways. So, but we could discuss that maybe later. So, those were just some examples of how I think you might be able to use feminist standards to contribute towards making technologies that foreground these commitments of feminism, um, 
to, to, to just really start wrapping things up, I just want to say something about equations very quickly and then feminist AI. So in this discussion at the opening of the Stan Stanford Center for Ethics and Society, which some of you may have seen on the internet, Yuval Harari opens by saying that everyone loves an equation. And so he's formulated this equation to encapsulate the AI um, crisis as he sees it. Okay, <laughs> and the equation that he came up with is B times C times D equals HH, which means biological knowledge times computing power times data equals the ability to hack humans. Um, I, I think he's taking the piss. I don't think he really believes in the, the equation, so it's kind of offensive in some ways, but we'll just stick with it for a minute anyway. So for him, the ability to hack humans is um, the ability to sort of understand them better than they understand themselves, you know, on the level of the body and the brain um, and the mind, so basically so that you can predict what they're going to do. So for him, the race that we're in right now is that it's actually a race for self-knowledge. And, and basically, it's game over if the algorithms get to know us better than we know ourselves first. And um, so I heard him, and um, partly I was really horrified at this sort of reductivist approach and the idea of reducing um, this kind of social, techno-social crisis to an equation. But then another part of me just really wanted to rewrite the equation in a feminist way. And I started to think about, well, can there ever be a feminist equation? So at the risk of being like completely reductive, I tried. And I thought, maybe it could be B plus F times C times FD equals HB, which means <laughs> biological knowledge plus feminisms times computing power times feminist data equals the ability to hack bias. So then, I got really depressed about the sort of gendered nature of hacking narratives. And um, I thought there probably isn't such a thing as a feminist equation in the same way that there isn't really a feminist response to, hey Alexa, what's the weather like today? And so, and I also thought I'm probably just trying to avoid answering the question that I'm supposed to answer in this talk, which is what would a feminist AI actually be? So. I'm going to just say a few thoughts about what that might be, and I really don't mean it to come across as a sort of, this is not supposed to be a set of standards. This is a kind of speculation on what qualities it might embody, um, and they kind of weave through the melting pot of principles that we've looked at. So I would say feminist AI is definitely not a system that's coded to evangelize about a particular political or ideological cause. Um, but it's more about the intention that it's created with. So I would say perhaps it's been created with the intention to foreground the central commitments of feminism, to recognize difference and not minimize it for the sake of universality, to meet a meaningful human need to consider the consequences of the attachments that people might develop to it, to incorporate feminist data, to care about how it's going to construct the user as the user constructs it, to avoid exploiting workers in its production. That's created with awareness of the entire ecosystem that it sits in is built by diverse teams who reflect on and actively challenge their human biases. And ultimately, it would not discriminate against anyone on the grounds of their race, class, age, belief, or ability. So, wow, it's 45 minutes exactly. Um, that's, that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. Charlotte, it was a really very interesting talk, and um, yeah, we met, I think, about already two years ago, when the feminist internet was already growing fast, but um, yeah, I'm really impressed to see what has happened, it's very exciting to Thanks. see 
all these recent developments. So um, we're running a bit late, so, but we still want to, of course, reserve some time to have questions also with the audience. Um, but before we open up to the audience, maybe could you tell us a bit more like how the whole feminist internet, internet initiative started and how it has like, evolved since then? Sure. Yep. So it started two years ago. Uh, it was actually a project at U University of the Arts London. It was, um, it was a 10 day experiment. Um, f again, f uh, it's an art and design university, so it has lots of different um, disciplines, but they are all in that field. Students from all across the university came together for 10 days and we had a two part brief. So they had to write a feminist internet manifesto by consensus and they had to prototype creative responses to issues of gender inequality and technology that they identified really quickly. And we did that. And we j presented what we did in those 10 days in a seminar. And um, ever since then, it just somehow took off and um, gathered this momentum very, very quickly. We ended up um, running events in sort of public institutions in London and then being invited to go and talk at places and run workshops at places. And um, we've managed to kind of knit, knit, knit ourselves together as a group and just keep going. And I think we've all been quite surprised by how fast it has sort of evolved. Yeah, that, that's amazing to see. But of course, with such a initiative has a really big goal, like to create more internet equality for, for everyone. It's a huge, like massive goal. So how do you, how do you handle working towards such a, such a big goal? Even as the initiative is growing, of course, it's still small and there's so much work to do. So how do you handle that? Yeah. I've got a friend who has this really good phrase. He says, um, he calls it the inertia of despondency, which is kind of like, what you get when you just look at all these massive problems and you think it's just too big to tackle, what are we gonna do, it's pointless, and you know, and then it's kind of de demotiva demotivating somehow. And I think the way that we are able to get through the inertia of despondency is by um, making things and trying to identify small, I mean, you see that this is massive kind of edifice of problems, but you try and pick one that's specific and then try and physically make a response. Um, and I think also the thing that kind of gets you through it is just the other people. I mean, there's 10 people in Feminist Internet and they're amazing and it's just so uh, incredible to know that you're sort of supported by other people that care about the same thing. So I think that's how you kind of, well, that's how we stick at it even when it seems impossible all right, that's great to hear. So, um, yeah, we have some time left. So, are there any questions from the audience for Charlotte? There's one over there. Hi, thank you. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, maybe you also answered it, but it's too hot to, I'm not sure if I got everything. Um, I wondered what is your, in, it's getting louder and louder, sorry. <laughs> uh, what is your intention in using, like, why using the technology? I mean, you, um, you said a little bit, but uh, I was thinking about this notion of working within the system or going outside of the system, maybe trying to find means that aren't like not focusing on like a tiny thing, but maybe focusing more on the broad system of it. Yeah. I mean, especially especially with that last workshop, the question came really to the fore of our minds because it was so specifically using Amazon's actual platform. And... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not even... I don't even mean, like, speci the specifics of the, of the company, but just going, like, outside of this um, notion of, of using, I don't know, using technology to save the world or something. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wouldn't say that we're proposing that technology can save I the know. world, mm -hmm. and and especially, um, I think we would agree with all of the all of the sentiments of the evening about how these are really human problems, and you can't just de-bias systems technologically. You have to understand the social context and all of those things. But I definitely, I, I, I can see that there's more scope to look at. Well, how do you go further? to um, think about operating outside dominant paradigms. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking that especially when this 
um, the bull bot came up and it said it's, uh, it, it tries to be neutral and objective and this is, I think it's like a, the, one of the basic paradigms that we have to accept that nothing is neutral and objective. Yeah, if, if I was going to um, give that team uh, some feedback, it would be around that particular comment, actually, because, um, and I think if they thought about it more, they'd probably rephrase it as well. So I'm glad you picked up on it, and I, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So do we have some other questions? Microphone is coming. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question's kind of fragmented, so I'm going to try and thread it together. But um, the project where people were building bots, um, I thought that it was quite striking that a lot of them seemed to take on a sort of educative or sort of a role that resembled some form of emotional labor. Um, and I think in certain things that I've read, there's the sort of suggestion that jobs that are typically ascribed to women are sort of the safest from um, AI. And if you sort of integrate those types of roles into AI, is there a danger that um, typically female, or roles done by women or other marginalized people disappear or they're not acknowledged or paid properly? Um, or is it also an opportunity to pay people for that labor? Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's, it's definitely a sort of tangle, isn't it, between the way that... Um, so if you look at the way those um, voice assistants, like home assistants, are gendered, they very, very clearly um, reproduce stereotypes about that type of labor. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a question only of the work that's done, but also how the work is characterized and represented in the device. And obviously, those two things both need to be taken into account. Um, and the question of whether or not devices can perform emotional labor, I think is really, really interesting. I, I had a conversation with someone the other day that said that they were working on a chatbot for in a school and it was trying to provide um, a sort of pastoral support for people that were having um, mental health problems or other problems around beginning at university. And they found that people were more willing to talk to the bot than to a person, which seems maybe counterintuitive, but I think it's because of the kind of safe space that, that talking to the device provides. Um, so I don't know what that says about the future of emotional, emotional labor, but I guess that that whole gap in the standards around labor would include questions like yours that I think are really, really important. We probably need to consider in more depth. Do we have some other other questions still? We have a bit more time, so don't hesitate. There's one over here. Hi, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I would have maybe kind of a technical question, uh, not technical, but it's just I got, um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with this voice uh, aspect, and I was just wondering if there were any tries to uh, mimic the voice of a user. So, because we, like, it, it seems that it goes on this gender, uh, gender neutral voice, and I was just thinking of, like, if we think of digital, sometimes there is this kind of projection of ourselves, and I was just curious to know if there were any experiments done with, yeah, kind of reflecting the, yeah, the voice of a user. So, um, as far as, I'm not massively technical myself, but as far as I understand it from conversations around how you could create a voice, it's, it's really hard to make a voice 
based on someone unless basically you have to record them for quite a long time and that's how it gets the voice of that person so you could do that but you couldn't do it automatically you'd have to they'd have to physically record themselves yeah Right, we have time for one or two other questions, if there are any. One on the first row. <laughs> yes, just more uh, philosophical question, but probably I'm opening up too much. Um, because, uh, I mean, I like also the discussion we had about the possible feminism and possible internet. And I think it's also very important the definition that you give of feminism because you are also speaking about technology and it's not only something about women but it's also really a vision of society, the way we could imagine also our culture related to technology. So I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate a bit on that and also especially on the idea of possible feminism, uh, why they're possible and which kind of feminism. And why is plural also? This is important. I was really hoping you wouldn't ask me to define feminism because, <laughs> I mean, I, I, so... Maybe that, there is no definition. No, exactly, know. exactly. And that's what the, the, that framing kind of suggests, that there's... I think there are, there are ways that you can talk about it, you can historicize it, you can look at the way that it's evolved and everything, but... To me, it's a kind of a practice, and it's that idea of how does, how is it refracted in the context of your life, and um, how could it be instructive or meaningful? I mean, might not be for everybody. We talk a lot about whether or not it's a, an excluding term because it might um, alienate people or you know, be too much too soon or something. I don't know. Um, and obviously there's lots of different sort of factions of feminism as well, including and, and a specific history of how feminism and the internet has kind of evolved and related to each other. So um, for me, it's a kind of practice of recognizing that people matter equally. But that's my, that's my kind of, the way that I kind of internalize it. And it's also a practice of trying to um, look at what the systemic problems are and to denaturalize norms and things like that. Um, but I think you kind of internalize feminism. I can't say, I can't, I can't generalize about that, but I have found that I've internalized it over time and it's changed in terms of what it means to me and how I think it can be effective in a kind of design context. All right, then we have time for one more question. If there's no more from the audience, I'm actually very curious to ask you what's, what's up next for the feminist internet? Like, what are you working on next? Okay, um, yeah, so we are, we're going to, well, we would really love to try to develop FX and more because it was, it's a very kind of initial prototype and I think there's lots of scope to develop it and see what context it could kind of function within. Um, we just released the first four episodes of a podcast, and so we we're really hoping to find some funding to um, keep that going, to kind of extend these ideas and the way that we communicate about feminist internet to a wider audience. Um, we want to keep doing workshops, and um, we also want to reversion our. Ma we do have a manifesto, but it's two years old, and we feel like we should reversion it with a kind of a wider community. So we're hoping to do that this year as well. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, I think it's a really great way to conclude our day. And also that brings a new question for the next day. So thank you, Lika, of course, for this great moderation. Uh, we were just uh, thinking now to announce uh, uh, the, for the, the next day, so tomorrow. And we are starting uh, at uh, 3.30. 
with an investigation how is government using big data. We have Crofton Black from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism that is also really speaking about the discourse of data and government uh, in UK. Um, and so this is moderated by Daniel Erickson from Transparency International. And then we have our keynote uh, with Mutal and Conde, racial discrimination in the age of AI. Um, and we will finish with a panel related on the politics of AI, uh, fighting injustice and automatic supremacism with Dia Kayali, Oskis and Dan McKillen. Um, so, uh, you also wanted to announce uh, our next community program? I wanted to briefly say, so for everybody that was here and is interested also to join our next community meetup, we're doing the next meetup on the 26th of June, and it will be about revealing and transforming algorithmic inequality. And we invited two, two initiatives to come talk, so it's the Open Shufa project for a BioPanelist Germany and Algorithm Watch. They've done very interesting work on reverse engineering the credit scoring system in Germany done by the private company Shufa. And they're, they're there to share some results with us and how they did that and what it actually revealed. And then we're also joined by the Oracle for Trans Feminist Technologies. And this is a really interesting speculative co-design card game. So we're actually also there to play the game and to give us a different vision of AI. And we also want to say uh, many thanks to the Guerrilla Foundation for funding our activation program. So, yeah, hope to see some of you there. Yes. <laughs> so we just uh, finished saying uh, goodbye and thank you for everything, uh, for being here. We meet tomorrow. And also remember to give uh, your little survey result uh, at the counter and also to buy the comic if you want, since there are si still some nice copy to buy. So thank you and see you tomorrow. And thanks to all the speakers. Thank you.